In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, folks, and welcome to In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host, Robbie Miller, and today's guest, well, I think you guys may know him. He has been in the trenches for a while. Um, I've actually known this guy for around, honestly, around about 20 years now. My first uh, experience of a show uh, with this guest was back in 2000, believe it or not. But anyways, I can't wait for you guys to meet him. Will you please welcome to In the Trenches, Mr. Brian Roxy. Hello, how are how you doing? Are you? I'm good, how are you? Nice to see you again. It's, it's, good been, to... it's been years. It has been, yeah, years, minutes, seconds, something like that. Um, thanks for coming on. Now, Ryan, before we get started, um, yes. I just want you to know that this is a C-word free zone. We're trying our best <laughs> to not mention uh, the C-word, and obviously we're all kind of in this global situation together, but without mentioning it too much, can you tell us how you are doing at your end, how you're coping with things, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? Is the C-word Chuck Garrick? Sure. Is the C-word <laughs> Calico Cooper? Is There's so many C-words. There are, yeah. You're, uh, you're, <laughs> you're, you're kind of doing the perfect guest answer right now. I appreciate uh, actually being here on my own show, and I appreciate mm -hmm. you taking the reins for this one. Um, it does feel weird. Shouldn't I be on the other side? I mean, Vic should have figured that out. Yeah, but, I, Vic, but that's. I mean, <laughs> if we can't do it, don't worry about it, Vic. I mean, it's just technical stuff. I mean, it's you know. Anyhow, yeah. How have I been holding up? I yeah. am uh, wearing my hat today in yeah. uh, sort of honor of california which is my hometown it is and or my home state yes and i know that the people in california are going through a bunch of crap we always mm -hmm. give a lot of uh props to the people in new york and the east coast but the west coast has been hitting hard too so right. uh my heart is out to them and uh i don't know i'm i'm chilling in stockholm i i just put out a Insta story. I said it felt weird not to be preparing for the show and just actually being prepared for the onslaught of questions you were going to ask me. So I, I went, walked down to the store mm -hmm. and then I figured I was doing something that a lot of people can't do these days. Just walk out into the streets and go grab some groceries without, you know, a huge, uh, you know, What are you list. doing? Yeah. yeah. It is a really weird time right now. I think I also feel quite uh, grateful that we can all be so creative and i think this team especially we're all just looking for new projects all the time and and that can be a great distraction but yeah the the lockdown is a weird one well right now the thing that i think a lot of people don't realize is that this lockdown might be longer uh, you know everyone says i can't wait till we get back to the normal you know there let's this might be let's normal. maybe Let's assume there is no normal. Let's assume yeah. that it's this is the new normal is going to be different than what we've ever been used to in the past. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, if we go back to going to you know side by side concerts, everybody's squishing together and going into mosh pits. Then let's be pleasantly surprised. But if not, let's be prepared as people, not just musicians, because you as a musician, myself as a musician we've had to find new places to perform and we might have to find new stages to perform on new yep. types of stages. So I applaud you for doing shows like this. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, yeah, it's, you know, anything just to keep, you know, reaching out to those in the trenches, finding about their story, uh, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And l I do want to bring it back. I want to take it back to the, the beginning, um, which sure. I believe is, in Sacramento, California. Wow. Oh, I thought it was just the beginning of our relationship when I taught you a guitar lesson. Are we going to get <laughs> to that at one point? We're going to get to that. Do you know what? When I was actually doing the research for this episode, I was writing down all this stuff and, and bringing it all together. I realized I'd written three pages worth of stuff. And I was thinking, man, I, I don't think we're going to get through all of it. But we've Was got it a fan it letter? There. Was, huh? it, was it a three-page fan letter? You know what? We're going to we're gonna get to a lot of this stuff, Ryan. <laughs> but I want to bring it back to actually... A Ryan Sacramento, Roxy, huh? Sacramento, but specifically a Ryan Roxy that not everyone might know because originally 
you actually went by the very first was Vic, Mister. Where is it? You guys got it's, a lot it's, of technical it's coming. stuff hey, going on today. We're we're wow. making it work. We're making it work. But yeah. you were originally Doctor Ryan Roxy with Doctor Ryan Roxy. Yes, yes, with a I y. <laughs> That's funny that you actually went that deep down the Ryan Roxy rabbit hole of the doctor. Well, first of all, I'm from California. I mentioned that earlier. And this is the uh, capital of California is Sacramento, where I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in the Bay Area. A lot of mm -hmm. people think I grew up in Los Angeles. I did grow up in Los Angeles, like just by sort of learning the ropes. There yeah. I am, Dr. Ryan Roxy. With the, with a Y. Well, well, a good attention to detail, because yes, when I first started uh, hanging out with my buds and and sort of thinking that I wanted to have this alter ego, be a musician, be a, I didn't want to be a musician. I wanted to be a rock and roll star. That's basically what I wanted to do since I was a little kid. Looking at the posters on my wall, I wanted to be Peter Frampton Comes Alive. I wanted to be that album cover. So um, I had... Uh, uh, some really good friends, a really tight group. There was three of us. It was my, myself, John Bristow, who I'm still really good buzz with today, and Steve Burks. And we called ourselves the Swingers. I, I know that was our gang, and it's a pretty pitiful name for a gang. But we called ourselves the Swingers uh, because of that Saturday Night Live skit with Dan Aykroyd and Steve Martin. I think uh, two wild and crazy guys, you know, that that old, old skit. And I'm sure Vic doesn't have a, uh, a clip to pull up of that, <laughs> but I'm sure he will. He well, wish he did. You wait. <laughs> but the, as far as the swingers go, uh, John was sort of the leader, and he was called Super Swinger. And then my other buddy, Steve Burks, was there. He was called uh, King Swing. Or maybe it was reversed. Maybe it was John Bristow was King Swing. And then my buddy was Super Swigger, Steve. And then me being the third one, I guess I had an education. I was Dr. Swing. Mm. So Dr. Swing eventually became Dr. Ryan Roxy. And back mm. in those days, I spelled it R-O-X-Y because I was, uh, I was unaware of the club in Los Angeles. I only started changing the name to IE when I moved down to Los Angeles. And there was a club called The Roxy, R-O-X-Y. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want everyone to think that I just patterned my name off the Roxy Club. Right. Although I did play the Roxy Club to dozens of people many times. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, I might be jumping a little bit ahead here, but when did you actually legally change your name to Ryan Roxy? Oh, and, and one second, oh, it, it is wine. It is wine time here. Oh, on <laughs> so uh, cheers, Ryan. Wine. Thanks for coming on. That's uh, white wine. You are this so is, Canadian. This is Pini, uh, Pinot Grigio. Um, it's not as water. It's, it's 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 early over there. You're not drinking wine Ryan, now, Ryan. Ryan, I am so dedicated to the team and the show. Please, he's um, committed. All right. You're can you committed. tell us about when you legally changed your name? Okay, Chief. this is the story, and this is how it goes. Um, I was 15 and a half. Because crazy enough, me being that I have a 17 year old and a 14 year old now, I can't even think of them driving. To be honest with you, can you imagine giving the the behind a wheel? You're allowed to drive at 15 and a half. You're allowed to get a learner's permit in California. So I went up to the DMV, and there's obviously someone's first day, and I passed my learner's permit. So when he looked up at me, he goes, "So what's your name?" And I said, "Well, it's Ryan Rosovich, but <laughs> I go by the name Roxy. It's it's all it's just right." He goes, "Roxy, okay, okay. Well, how do you spell that?" And, and he just typed it. It was it was before computers. He typed it into a typewriter, R-O-X-Y. So from then on, when it actually came in the mail, because the learner's permit turns into a driver's license once you take the test and you drive and parallel park and do all this stuff. And um, I actually passed it on the first test. I'm pretty happy about that. But to my surprise, even though they had both names, they went with R-O-X-Y uh, and... The rest is basically Ryan Roxy history because from there I was able, you know, I, I it had legally started and then I started working under that name and then I started um, getting, uh, what, what was it called? A, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank now. When you Possible? have, uh, yeah, no, no, a, a social security card. Okay. And, and, and then the big one was I, for many years I was R Ryan Roxy, AKA. Ryan Roksevich. So I had to have that. I had to carry that weight for a while. Right. But uh, then it eventually became just Ryan Roxy. And 
to this day, I have, uh, yeah, I've toured the world as why not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, elsewhere. So, I mean, in, in a way, you really have always been doing this imagine your reality thinking and ethos from quite an early age you sort of decided you wanted to be a rock star you wanted to do the rock and roll thing you gave your same you gave yourself a uh, a, a persona a different name you really have sort of grown into that into well, Ryan no Rock. joke no joke i the album title imagine your reality even though i released it as like my latest solo album and my first actual solo album under my name mm -hmm. i have been doing that ever since i was a little kid i remember used to go you know going to bed and sort of saying my prayers and you know i was a good little catholic boy you know mm -hmm. growing up mm -hmm. since become a bad little boy I <laughs> tell guess. us more about that the years yeah well, we'll go through that <laughs> but but i used to always imagine myself on stage playing in front of a lot of people that was mm -hmm. basically my uh, daily nightly routine yeah. and um of course i would pray that someday i'd become a I, I did say i wanted to become a cop or a stunt man wow those were the two other occupations i had yeah, and, and as you could see, I wasn't really built for being either of those. <laughs> I think I would have lost my job the first day as a stunt man. I used to always think being a stunt man was cool. So right. a stunt man or a cop, and then it was like, no, I want to be a rock and roll star. Yeah. So um, I still haven't gotten there to where I feel I'm there yet, but I keep kept on imagining it, and eventually did get to play the same stage and have that same look that I used to uh, imagine every single night, looking out from the crowd. Or uh, from from the stage to the crowd. That's one right. people. That's one thing I do tell people about imagining your reality. Don't imagine yourself. Don't imagine looking at yourself on stage. Imagine yourself being on stage. Right. Imagine yourself being wherever you want to be, like you've already accomplished it. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my advice. So, when you were beginning to start to learn music, and you know pick an instrument i know you dated the drums for a while um <laughs> but then switched to the guitar if i'm right at about 10 or 11 years old yeah um, i had a one night stand with the trumpet don't forget that right you know it was uh, i started on the trumpet my, my father had played trumpet in like the military band so there was a trumpet lying around but let's admit it i mean how many rock star trumpets players are there name one quickly flea flea <laughs> What really? Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah. Um, I think that's a beagle. Oh, a bugle. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't know. I European no version. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a uh, um, but trumpet, and then yeah, I sort of like you said, dated the drums. I, I realized real quickly that the drums were like way too heavy for me to carry, and had it would entail having a van of some sort, which I eventually did get a van, but mm -hmm. um then having to set set up in back i think that was the deal killer that yep. was sort of the deal breaker for me is having to set up in the back and sort of leave last at any yep. gig so yep. yeah that, so I, I quickly moved to guitar and uh but i did have a cool looking drum kit i had a, a five piece slingerland tiger striped drums kit if someone wow. hey, can you pull that picture up yeah you, you, yep. you won't find it, it was we've got different it was photographs were taken <laughs> <laughs> you think they picked, just had wall drawings of it? No, but it was a five-piece painting. Yes, yes, yeah. it was an artist rendition. <laughs> um, so, but it, I, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to uh, just talk a little bit more about the posters on your wall. You always mention the posters on your wall were bands like Cheap Trick, The Cars. Um, I got some other bands here that you listed off before Van Halen. Obviously, that first yes. album I know was very influential for you obviously guitar driven rock bands but can you just maybe go into a little bit more um past the guitar side of things what was it about the cars cheap trick van halen those bands? bands like that yeah i think it was always about the songs for me yeah. i really loved catchy songs but with driving guitars and yes. all those bands that i would list had a certain amount of guitar driven songs of course the cars had synths in it as well but at the end of the day elliot easton the guitar player from the cars is one of my biggest he's one of the, sort of the unsung heroes of of mine 
because I feel that his parts and his solos and, and what he brings to every single song really influenced me with my own songwriting and my own playing and my own development. Obviously, Eddie Van Halen was a rock star to, you know, from the get go. And I just kind of just wanted to emulate that. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, Cheap Trick for me, they were my Beatles. And, and I had, even though I'd been grown up listening to the Beatles, Cheap Trick was the next thing, the next evolution of the Beatles in my mind. So that first time, because uh, we used to travel down to Southern California to visit my family, my mom and I would drive down the Highway 5 to see our family. Uh, most of her family, I guess, would be down in Southern California. I went to a party and Cheap Trick at Budokan was playing at that party that, not the actual Cheap Trick, but the album, mm -hmm. the vinyl album. And I remember sitting next to that vinyl player the entire night i didn't socialize with one person i was social distancing way before it was even a thing yeah. and i distanced myself with a record player and every time side a would would and i'd, I'd split it over to side b and, and and so on and so forth so i would go through the entire album and um it was great so that was my and then when i came back up to uh northern california i immediately bought all the cheap trick records of course uh the album heaven tonight had a poster in it so i hung that on my wall my mom was always really cool about letting me put uh posters on my wall and sort of making my room my world because my room because basically became my world mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about, you know, always filming stuff in my son's room. Maybe someday he'll live in New York and he'll go, why do I live in New York? <laughs> I don't know why, but, you know, I, I feel it's if, if you're a parent out there and you have kids that are young, let them do what they want to their room. Their room is their sanctuary. It mm -hmm. became mine. It became my sort of, I would play hours and hours of uh, air guitar in the mirror, not just practicing guitar with it on. I'd practice without it when mm -hmm. air guitar, I don't know if it's a thing, but you know, look at the thing. Yeah. People used to call me and have called me for years. You're a poser. I say, yeah, but I'm a professional poser. Yeah, you absolutely <laughs> are. So Cheap Trick were obviously really, uh, really influential. I'm actually, I kind of discovered, well, probably through you, Cheap Trick a lot later than maybe I should have. But I remember getting that first album and seeing on side one, it says side one. And on the second side, it says side A. And I remember yes. thinking, why is that? And I looked it up and they said, because the album is so good, you can play it either side. Uh, that, that, was thought, so that was so them. cool. Yeah, they um, all, well, their whole concept, Cheap Trick's whole concept was cool. Let's have two guys that are uh, bigger than life rock stars and let's have two cartoon characters that, that could be in any sort of Looney Tunes cartoon. And mm -hmm. let's, let's combine them and make characters out of them all. And basically, yeah, I wanted to have, like Damone says in the movie, uh, Fast Times at Richmond High, uh, the charisma of Robin Zander. So he says something like that. Again, Vic, you should have the clip. I don't know why you don't. What's, what's going on with Vic today? <laughs> but there, oh, look at that comment. Mark Denzison is, is honestly, that comment is so true. It's the reason why, Ryan, I've been friends for 36 years. Mm -hmm. And Mark was a big uh, Cheap Trick fan growing up in southern california i was growing up in northern california and eventually our worlds uh, collided musically with gilby mm -hmm. clark band and, and we always shared that love of, of cheap trick now I, I actually that's a great segue so thank you very much for that can you i guess one of the first real bands i say real but maybe when things were starting to become very serious for you was a band called candy who i believe you were a late addition to Candy yeah. were already a band. I got the band. I got in the band. Of, I don't, again, I'm referencing old TV shows, but I got into the band Candy because I'm, I was Johnny Bravo. I fit the suit. Mm -hmm. I actually, there's an old episode of the Brady Bunch mm -hmm. where I, I don't know, Peter or Greg Brady gets the gig in a band because he actually fits the same size suit. Well, with Candy, I was this guy running around Los Angeles with super spiked black hair uh, and a black leather jacket and ton of Aquanet in my hair. Mm -hmm. And so were these other guys, you know, in this band called Candy. It was just Gilby and John, Jonathan, John Schubert, Kyle Vincent. So they were, um, they would say, uh, people would say to them, hey, there's this guy that should be in your band. He's this Ryan Roxy character. And people would come up to me and say, you know, you should really be in that band Candy. So we all converged at a gig 
in uh, Southern California called Madam Wong's West. Man, don't look for it anymore. It's not there. But <laughs> <laughs> the tales that place could tell. It was it that place was basically held together by cocaine dust and broken dreams. But it had so much potential. It was it was it was such a great rock and roll club. I seen actually I saw uh, I think I saw Michael DeBar there. You know, and he really? he was just on the show yeah. um, a couple weeks ago. Can't hear you, bro. <laughs> Can't hear you, bro. Love Michael. Yeah, it does. I quite love but that. anyway, I, I think I saw Checkered Pass there. I saw <laughs> there he is. Vic has that. He still has that though. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we 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 met there, and then we decided that maybe we should try playing together, being mm -hmm. that we kind of fit together, locked together, looking image wise. And then of course their music, their power pop. Um, world in a sort of heavy metal scene sort of jived with me because i've always been sort of a bit more of a pop guy yep. surrounded by uh more of a heavy metal heavy music or heavy driven guitars yep. like, like i said I, i'm i'm dave i i'm keith partridge trapped in a keith richards world Does that, <laughs> that makes any sense yeah absolutely yeah there's your sound bite i like that <laughs> that's a good analogy um in Candy, Gilby left, and the band became Electric Angels. Yes. Right? Yeah, well, Gil Gilby left and then joined a another band. I don't know if you heard that one eventually. It started as Kill for Thrills, and then that band, uh, then he got asked to join Guns N' Roses. So that right. basically set his path on a very yeah. high trajectory. Um, us, on the other hand, with Electric Angels, we were bashing it out in the clubs. We had um, well, a guy named I Wayne. Sorry, can I just interject? Was there any, was there anything about if the band should split up or, you know, what what was that sort of decision to carry on? Well, we actually like, did. Good, good question, Robbie. Because I, I, a lot of people always ask me what happened with Candy, how with the the demise of Candy, and and what did it split into? Well, we did some shows because originally Kyle Vincent was singing in Candy, <laughs> and then uh, whatever happened before I came into the picture. They were going to look for someone else to sing. And we did try out a lot of people, Ricky Rackman being one of them. Um, a lot of people tried out for Candy. They came down to this uh, this old rehearsal studio in, in downtown LA that we had, that we were rehearsing out of. And then Gilby just said, why don't I try? I can sing. I kind of, you know, I can do this. So we did a few gigs as Candy with Gilby Clark fronting it. And then eventually it was like, well, you know what, Gilby... I, wanted to do his own thing with kill for thrills so he just ended up starting that band and then the three of us me john schubert and jonathan daniel were like well we need to find a singer again we're still at that position and then we found shane mm -hmm. and then shane just you know his image was over the top you know cool glam he was like you know he had this picture around los angeles of him in a microphone and that's all it needed that's all it took that one picture got us so many gigs, opened so many doors. And we were playing so many opening shows for bands that uh, like we would play uh, opening up for uh, Jane's Addiction one weekend wow. and then the next Balam and the Angel. And then um, we would open up for Zodiac Mind Warp. That was another really uh, eventful. So we were the sort of favorites of opening bands, but we, wanted more and every record company passed on us by the way in on the west coast we wow. had we had tried to shop our demo bruce Kulick produced uh the first electric angels demo and everybody had passed so we decided during that time to do something completely 180 degrees different when everybody was moving to los angeles in the 80s to be in a hair band we decided to move out of Los Angeles and move to New York City mm -hmm. and try and give it a go there because we knew that everybody, at least in the business, had already kind of signed off on Electric Angels. It's a great opening band, but you know what? We're not ready to sign them. Mm. Within three shows of moving into New York, we got a deal with Atlantic, which is one of the companies that had actually passed on us in Los Angeles. There we How are. about that? Hey, there's the album. Wait, Good one, Vic. Vic. You're on top of it. Yeah. All right. So that, that, as, as you can see, if you can go back to that picture, as you can see, that's uh, Jonathan on the yeah. left, and then there's then there's Shane, John Schubert. There's myself. 
so contrary to popular belief, I didn't just start wearing hats recently. I have always worn the hat and that hat is still special. It's still somewhere, I, I think, you know, in a storage unit somewhere. Now, how had you guys seen, and I, I, I feel like this, you, you would have got inspiration, but maybe I'm wrong. Had you guys seen the Choir Boys and Dogs to Moor before? Was We'd that seen was pictures. that any kind of right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and but I think at the end of the day, we all saw the same album covers, and we were all influenced by the same album covers. Whether it was an old Rolling Stones, Exile in Main Street sort of photo shoot, mm -hmm. or it was any Hanoi Rocks album cover. Yes, yeah. At that course. point, Hanoi Rocks to me, I, I, I always say this: there would have there would be no Guns and Roses, um, and there would be really a different type of hair metal scene in Los Angeles if it wasn't for Hanoi Rocks. Michael yeah. Monroe, Andy McCoy, and mm -hmm. the rest of Hanoi Rocks were like sort of our poster aisles when it came to album covers. Their image was so, uh, it, it had like a, they, and they were influenced by sort of Rolling Stones, New York Dolls, that sort of glam image, but they were sort of our new heroes. And wow, there you go. So that's quick. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good actual. I mean, look at that. Would would you not pay to see that band? I yeah, asked you. Yeah. <laughs> and and honestly, I mean, when it does eventually become my show again, we are going to have Michael Monroe on as a guest. And I, I, I sure heard about that. You heard I mean, not unless you completely, you know, kibosh the show and, and I, from you know what? On. I feel like there would be I I feel like a petition would come out. It would get <laughs> dozens of signings and people would say no we want ryan back nah <laughs> robbie so, you're doing amazing and, and you know what just so you know because i know you're not going to plug it but if it was my show i would plug it you got a new single coming out right you just had a single that came yeah. out yesterday yeah. and so come on take wow. a smile well take thank a, you very take a bow, take a <laughs> smile folks out there they're watching <laughs> there it is well, you know what Thank you very much. I, I, I do want to plug it, but at the same time, I really want to, I, this is your episode and I, I, I really want to uh, get really, get even a little bit deeper into this because um, after Electric Angels, I'm sort of going to around 94, 96 now, you really were doing quite a lot of work. You had played guitar on three um, Gilby Clark albums and an EP. You had done work with Tal Backman. Um, and you had also done session work work with James uh, Michaels, who now yeah. sings in 6 a.m. Right. That is quite a busy two years. And I just want to get um, maybe just an, some thoughts from you. What was that like during here's, that time? Here's exactly what happened. Yeah, I had always remember I was talking about how I was a nice, you know, Catholic boy growing up in the Bay Area. Yes, um, I was became quickly not the nice <laughs> sort of guy when I moved down to Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, it, it was uh crazy times. Obviously yep. you want to hear about, you know, all the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll. Yes, that does exist. That did happen. And I'm happy to have lived that way and happy to have gone through it. I'm glad I'm even happier that I survived it. Right. But one thing during those days up through electric angels, I was always a one sort of, a one man band or a one band man. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I didn't go play in a bunch of different bands when right. I was in electric angels or candy. I, I stayed with my guys, but when I did sort of break apart, break, break off from electric angels, cause they ended up eventually did an, another record uh, under the name electric angels. But when I, or I think it was, it was a different name that they did. I think they, yeah, the loveless, I'm sorry. They, so we, I, I, we basically had a trip to Los Angeles and I just stayed in Los Angeles. Oh really? Yeah. That was, it was, wow. we had a tour booked for Los Angeles. We went from New York to LA and then I just stayed there because I knew that my destiny was to start whoring myself to as many bands as possible. So, you know, I started playing and getting myself and jamming with as many people as I could, trying to get knowledge from this guitar player, knowledge from this singer, knowledge from this band. And eventually that's how I met uh, James Michael, one of my mm -hmm. good friends, uh, Mike Pavlik, who we didn't cover because he was in one of the first bands I've ever joined in in the Bay Area oh, called let, Starfire. Let's cover him now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Mike Pavlik was 
really good friends with James Michael. And then he brought me into that. So I played on James first album called inhale. You can check it out. If you listen to it, then you'll go, Oh yeah, I hear a lot of Roxy's playing in it now because I'm basically doing the same sort of, uh, type of style of playing that I do in all my records. I try mm -hmm. to make, I try to make, uh, write good parts that complement the song, and hopefully that came across in James' record. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did that, and then I—you're right—I did play with um, a bunch of different people. Uh, Gilby asked me back to his solo band, and that's when I started um, getting my first real taste of touring. I had toured with Electric Angels. We opened up for with uh, Danger Danger and Hurricane, mm -hmm. and we had toured on a very van level. You know, we were. We were self-promoting before the internet even really was a thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think with Gilby, it was the first time to go on a tour bus and get to go spend record company people's money. That was fun. And you also, know, getting, yeah. Yeah. And also doing like cool TV shows like Letterman was one, right? You did Letterman with... Ooh, that was a little bit later. Yeah. With okay, all right. I, I was able to do some... I, I have been able to do some cool late night shows. I did... Uh, what, what, was one, what was the one with Gilby, though? There's a there's a great... Um, John Stewart. That was John the first... Stewart, uh, right, I yes. did the John Stewart show before it was sort of political satire. John Stewart was more of a, a entertainment show. Yeah. Kind of... Who knows? Maybe someday in the trenches becomes political satire. I'm not sure. Or become more topical. But, you know, it was more when it was just about the music and entertainers. And um, I remember meeting John Stewart on the trip to New York and playing those... Yeah. When you... When you when I look back on it and I think, okay, I've been able to do the John Stewart show, uh, Leno, uh, the Tonight Show, I've been able to do Conan. These are all yeah. things I'm really thankful for because... You know, in today's world, and who knows tomorrow's world, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go to Stephen Colbert's house and play his living room <laughs> because I've been watching a lot of late night TV now, and they're all doing it from their houses. But when you were doing these shows, were you thinking at the time, like, where was your mind? Were you thinking at the time, this is so cool, or were you just... You just going with the flow. Do you, was it I wish I wish I had subscribed to the enjoy the ride sort of philosophy that I have been really subscribing to these last years. Mm. But at, I think at that time I was always uh focused on what's next. I want more. Mm. What's next? Instead mm. of it just enjoying the journey, instead mm. of it's just enjoying what it is right now. And now I realize how much I value the journey and how much people out there right now, if you're striving to achieve a goal and try, striving to make it, how much you should really just be enjoying the process. Because back then it was more about, this is cool, but you know, I want to be the guy that's in front. It's like, no, at that time, you're the guy that's playing guitar, supporting your bud. Mm -hmm. That's you should be content with that because mm -hmm. that's what's happening right now and it's opening all these opportunities. Yeah. Like I said, I, I'd like to lie to y'all and say that it was uh, I, I was always sort of yeah Zen bro, but I'm I, I'm not that guy. I'm a, you know I'm not Matthew McConaughey. Uh, you know, <laughs> twenty four hours a day. Mm -hmm. I was really caught up into competition mm -hmm. and especially when that when competition comes in and when when. Uh, any sort of comparison comes in with you and some other artists, then all of a sudden ego takes over. And mm -hmm. then when your ego takes over, people go, Hey, that guy's an asshole. And the minute people start saying you're an asshole, then it, you know, you can be the nicest guy in the world, but you, you're an asshole once and that sticks. And I think that stuck more than once for me. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm pretty secure with myself nowadays, but I think back then I wasn't as, so that probably fucked me in a few situations. Well, but you know what? Maybe it also did you a favor. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, I'd, I don't know, hindsight and, and no regrets and all that. Look where you are now. Look at all the all this. Now you're looking back and saying, well, that was cool. And you sort of can enjoy the, ro the ride from a different angle now, I suppose, on that. Journey. Absolutely. Yeah, you're 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 exactly right when you say that, and and I guess you have to go through it. But at the same time, if I could bestow any advice on to people listening that are wanting to, uh, I'm listening. Yeah, 
enjoy where you're at right now because this is a this is the magic time. I was actually I was uh, distracted for a second with a co- with a comment that uh, Mark just made. Mark Denzies and said the hour on stage was magic. Off stage, our minds worked overtime, and that's exactly what can happen. And that's exactly what I kind of am preaching nowadays mm-hmm. to try. You're never going to get yourself to. Oh, to just sit back and be completely calm. But hopefully you can take a step back and realize that to, to lower the importance every once in a while and enjoy the moment. Like right now, you putting your single out this week, that's a big deal. And I know that you told me, you know, prior in the week that you, you couldn't sleep. And that's a that's a good time not to sleep. Mm. It's not good to sleep when you have stress. It's right. amazing not to sleep when you have you stress, which mm-hmm. is the, like sort of the opposite of stress. And if you have you stress, it means that, that you're just like you're excited and you're you're driven. And I, and I'm not saying don't be driven about goals, just in you know because that's what gets you to the next point in life. But enjoy the journey, definitely. Yeah. Um, I want to now move into. I know with the the problem with this is that we can miss so much, but I want to move into the world of Alice Cooper and, of course. and the reason why a, lo- a lot of people are here right now. I, and I thank you guys for coming out, man. That's, that's yeah. awesome. awesome. I, I'm looking at, at how many people are watching and I'm excited. I mean, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know how this experiment would work. You, I knew you'd do a great job. I just didn't know how many, I talk about myself all the time in my own show. So why would someone come to hear me? To my own well, interview <laughs> well do you know what though i th- i feel like i i'm i feel really lucky to be able to to do this and i'm, I'm glad you took this idea on as well and, and we can make it happen because i have been lucky enough to uh do playing you know play music with you and and hear some of these uh these stories these fly on the wall stories and and anecdotes and whatnot so um i feel like it's you know there's some there's some good stuff here we can talk about for sure in 1996 that yeah. was the year you joined Alice. That's um, a good year. You got a one tour contract or a yes, one year contract, I should say. Well, like a well, one year agreement, was, I should yeah, say. Yeah, it was the promise of you'll you'll at least tour one year with the Scorpions. You know, they didn't tell me that one year I, you'd probably lose your hearing. They didn't tell me that one year it could probably uh, turn your your ego, you know, from sort of a modest person to, you know, well, I wasn't really even modest even back then, but I, I got to be honest. <laughs> I I started to become a little bit uncontrollable when I was put in that position. But I was you have to understand, I was I was touring with the Scorpions. When you tour with the Scorpions, and and, and like you're, it's the first time I ate sushi. Uh, I remember the bass player from the band uh, turned me on to. So it's weird, you know. I, I think I taught, I think I fed my kids sushi when they were like five or six years old, but I was like well into my 30s when yeah. I first had sushi. And then, of course, being able to play and, and see uh, Rudolf Schenker, you know, every night and and Klaus Mind sing his ass off. I mean, it's still amazing. to this day, they're, they're, they're incredible. But I did lose my hearing, and that's, I, I, I would remember waking up on the tour bus. With it, with it, thinking it was screeching, halting, like yeah, stopping, and then with it, like getting up, and then realizing that we had been parked for like hours. So, wow, yeah, that uh, I, I, I learned quickly after that tour to use earplugs, and I have ever since, whether it's in ear monitors or earplugs. Yeah. Go. Um, when you got the Alice gig, I think we've heard the story of the the audition. Quite, you know, uh, I think right. a lot of us have, have heard that story now. Um, so, but I want to ask you, how did you get the news? I feel like it's hard for maybe, you know, maybe even me, for some of us to really try and appreciate how any of us get any kind of news if it's not a Facebook message or an email or a text or an Instagram message. So how did you get the news? I've gotten the, the news Alice twice to be in the Alice Cooper band. I've been lucky enough not to get, get the news once, but I've got it twice. The, the, the right. last time in 2012, I actually got a call from uh, Bob Ezrin. Which was quite really? cool. Okay. Which is you know, long time yeah. Alice Cooper uh, producer, and he said, "Hey, man, congrats! You're in the band." <laughs> and so that was you know a decision that him, uh, Shep, Gordon, Alice's manager, and Alice himself were able to make. So yes, that. But but the first time, I think I got the news, at least inwardly, when 
Alice and I locked eye contact when we locked eyes when I was walking out of the rehearsal studio because you know you have to picture we were at Mate's rehearsal studio in in the valley and that's in Los Angeles it's it's uh, basically a very famous rehearsal studio where you know Guns N' Roses Foo Fighters uh, Master Pussycat, like almost every band rehearsed there back in the day. Bobby from Mates, that's that he's the owner. And um, we rehearsed with Eric Singer on, we did the audition with Eric Singer on drum, Bob Daisley on bass, and Alice, who, you know, to all his credit, showed up for the audition and wanted to see who his guitar players were. Yeah. So after I did my thing, and I, you know, I, I do tell the story about the guitar, and it was shiny, and it, I kind of felt like I, I switched my plane at the very last minute, because I wanted, I knew that Alice had already chosen a shredder, because you know, at the audition there was a lot of shredding guitar players there. There was, yeah. you know, Reb Beach was was there, and I, I felt that he really played. Uh, really unique style and especially nailed all the 80s stuff and mm -hmm. um, was such a still to this day such a great player That's amazing. but um i kind of knew that he was a lock a little bit so i felt that i had to maybe play a little bit more legato maybe be that 70s version of the alice cooper band that people enjoy as well and so i just went for it and afterwards i, l I remember walking out of the uh of the studio and alice and I walk locking eyes and him just going, huh, you never know. So I, I think he might have had a different opinion of me walking in and left with and when I was leaving, changed his mind just a little bit because maybe he didn't think maybe he thought I was all image. Maybe he thought I was, you know, wait a second, this guy just is is not going to hold it down the way. I'm used to having this level of musicianship. Mm -hmm. And that day, like I said, the stars aligned and I, I was very uh, lucky to nail that B section of poison, which yep. I said is, is key mm -hmm. for me uh, getting the gig. One of the things, but honestly, just that eye contact, that's when I kind of knew. Okay. But uh, so you, you sort of, I think you knew deep down, but what about receiving the news? Who gave you the call? That, How that did was, you get uh, That was actually Brian Nelson, which was at the time, yeah. um, God rest his soul, he's passed away, but Brian Nelson was Alice's assistant. And um, just so you know, side note, Alice's current assistant, Kyler Clark, it's his birthday that's today. Birthday. So I'm just kidding. anybody that's watching, please wish Kyler Clark on Serial Kyler. You could uh, always just wish me, because we basically look very much alike. <laughs> So, <laughs> but you I both got, play bass. I got, my, I got my Kyler Clark. I'm wearing my jean jacket. I got my Kyler Clark beard. Kyler Clark did teach you the correct way to play schools out. Yeah, <laughs> he did, and in he Nashville. schooled me in Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Vic. That's good. So, but going back to Alice's prior assistant, uh, which was Brian Nelson, very cool dude. Uh, he all for me. He always supported. Uh, the stuff that I had done. And, and from what I had heard from folklore is that he didn't really always support the band members on their side project, but he had always, he had always been very supportive of me. I think he thought um, maybe I would provide that seventies element to, uh, to the Alice Cooper band that at that mm -hmm. time had, you know, was coming out of the eighties was coming out of that early nineties. It was looking for that identity. So maybe a mix of both. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what it's been ever since. Alice Cooper band has always had to ride that, uh, that line of, okay, which people are coming for the seventies version of Alice Cooper, which people are coming for the eighties, which people are coming for sort of the nineties, 2000 vibe, you know, because uh, there's a lot of people, maybe yourself included that the first time they saw Alice Cooper was with me playing guitar, which is quite surreal for me that I'm considered your, original guitar player well <laughs> for those who um i've had a few messages lately actually saying how did you how did you and ryan first meet and i've sort of said uh, for a couple of days now a couple of weeks now like well just hold off because there might be a way we can just answer all this in, in one go are you sure that wasn't just three messages from federock <laughs> actually <laughs> federock. um but we you love were you were the first Alice Cooper guitarist I saw. The first Alice Cooper show I saw was in two thousand. Um, I had I, I actually had a little bit of a fanboy moment the other day watching the Kane Roberts 
episode because I remember watching uh, the Nightmare Returns tour video cassette tape that my dad owned religiously and how wow. I got, that's how I got into like seeing that huge stage and um, and just knowing, okay, hold on a minute. These guys do this for a living. I want to maybe try this. And then my dad come, my dad saying to me, Alice, Alice Cooper's touring. Do you want to go and see him? And I said, absolutely. Year 2000. I, I didn't even know what album at the time. I was 10. I didn't even know what album had come out, but Brutal we went Planet. and watched it. It was the Brutal Planet tour. Yeah. And I remember, first of all, uh, Dio opened. So I feel like I can always say I saw Ronnie Kick James. Kick ass Dio. every night. Yeah. Let me tell you that. Dio right. was so good on that tour. Yeah. Oh, it was awesome. Well, it was, it was what an amazing lineup. Ronnie James, Dio, Alice Cooper. Brian May came out for Schools Out at that show. Yeah, that was one of my bucket list moments when to, I actually got to hold the guitar, and uh, that was that was Brian May's relationship with uh, Eric Singer. Mm. You know, I do always I, I do say a lot that it, you know be cool to the people that you've played with in the past because they'll help you in the next gig, and um, you know Eric that was a good example because Eric had played with Brian May before, and then Brian May came down and played jammed with us. And yeah, that was just, an, an, and don't forget Rat opened up uh, that tour. And of course, we all know Rat as uh, basically Dave Rattenberry. Yeah. I actually know the name Rat for Dave Rattenberry now. I forget their band sometimes. Who called them that? Was it Who invented that name for the Rat? Did anybody? I think we're speaking to him right now. Oh, let's give him a little, hey, there he is. There's a little <laughs> shout out for the Rat. I saw you back there. That's enough. That's enough. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Let me do my show. <laughs> it's not even my show. It's my interview. Thank you guys for watching. I remember seeing that show. I remember watching you specifically and the the flashy GMP guitars. And I remember just thinking, okay, well, this is it now. This is what I, I want to do as well. But I want to speak a little bit about that tool because it was an introduction to Alice for me. It was quite interesting hearing you play the Brutal Planet stuff, quite industrial heavy metal music. Yep. And then when I started to look into your your uh, your uh, your older back catalog, hearing the Dad's Porno Mag, pop power pop type stuff, you've always actually you know realizing well you 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 write pop rock songs. You you like this the power That's pop. What I what said was, earlier. I'm, what was I'm it like, like this, though? Yeah. I'm, I'm you know. Keith Partridge trapped in a yeah. Nikki Six world. I don't know. I mean, actually, to be honest with you, Nikki Six pretty pop too. And 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 here's yeah. the honest honest truth. I feel that Alice Cooper is more pop than his doom and gloom sort of image because whenever we're in the car, just the two of us, you know, listening to Michael DeBar in the morning driving he'll start singing the pop songs. He'll know every single word to all the power pop songs, uh, especially the early 70s songs. So we maybe we are sort of, we love the guitar though. Trust me, we love heavy guitar. I love have down, you know, uh, detuning. I like the drop detuning, which in that yep. era was Brutal Planet, Dragon Town. Yes. We had a lot of different types of uh, detuning. That would have to do with Bob Marlette and the production of those albums. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, I, I'm a song pop oriented guy. So when you listen to some of those songs or hopefully some of those solos, you hear sort of like a hookiness that you could possibly hear in, say, more of a traditional pop song, sort of like my my solo in the Tal Bachman "She's So High" yes. video. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Well, I I I'm trying really hard to not gloss over all of this kind of stuff. There's going to be a few angry people, I think, that go, "Why didn't you ask this question? Why didn't you do this?" Well, but go, go on. I mean, we have some time. I know we have to keep it under certain times time constraints and stuff. But maybe it's one of those things where, like, of course, we're going to do some in the trenches episodes in the future. In the next couple of weeks, I I sort of let the cat out of the bag. Can we, can we say it right now? Michael Monroe is going to be yes. our guest next week. Yes, yes, Michael yes. Monroe from Hanoi Rocks, one of my you know hero bands growing up. He's going to be our guest. And then the week after, we've got um, Chuck Garrick from Bisto Blanco. Yeah. And obviously, you know he's on stage right with me every single night with the Alice Cooper right. band. But we have some guests lined up the next couple of weeks. But maybe a, a few weeks from now, I can come back on and we could do some sort of a part two. I think there might have to be a part two for this, but oh. I want to speak 
a little bit more about um, your engagement with people, um, your engagement with with your fans and your friends, because um, I know you've made a lot of friends during these touring and uh, doing the touring and releasing the albums. You have always done such an amazing job at speaking with people, catching up with people before and after shows. Do you remember shows? Do you remember when people used to go to a gig and everyone used to hang out? <laughs> back when, huh? Wow. You you did a great, you'd still do a great job and you always have. I'm now reflecting sort of back on those early days because I remember I sent Ryan Roxy an email in, in probably 2000 um, and you definitely responded, yeah, which was so, a big, which was, which was a mistake because then I emailed you again and then I emailed you again and then I emailed you again. And do you know what? Hopefully we've got Vic on, on the button ready to do this. Um, <laughs> but then we managed to, I managed to meet you, which would Did have been in 2005. <laughs> Get the hell out of it. How are, you look like, you look like very <laughs> tiny. You, you well, like, I'm, I'm still tiny. I'm still no, kind of short. <laughs> honestly, you look like like physically like a, a doll. Were you like yeah, a, a but do you know what? I, I, it's such a good job I never shave this beard <laughs> off now because that is what you would get that. You would get a picture of me on, on like that. Which, now, that's not just my first photo with uh with ryan roxy get out of uh, here. we've got another photo um vic can we maybe get the one from dave rattenbury Wait, is this that is, dave rattenbury right now that is Does dave rattenbury britney wants me shirt on right there he has a britney oh, wants me shirt. On right we there. used to do a a, a a sort of segment in the show with calico cooper playing the role of, of britney spears i think she might have yes. talked about it on her past episode of in the trenches but but you know she we had this thing where Alice would wear this Brit me wants me, which is so creepy in some ways because Brittany wants me is just weird enough already because Alice is whatever age he is. And Brittany was like probably a Disney star, but then his daughter was playing the role of Brittany. So it gets so twisted in turn, but yeah, yeah. but I'm glad that Dave found it important to wear the shirt. Is, wow. is it is it original shirt or was it actually? Uh, did he make? Is that a one that he did an iron on himself? I don't I can't know. see because of his uh, age. The stage hurt. used uh, the satchel, but you know we'll we'll, we'll, ask, we'll ask Dave. But hey, do you know what? So you've seen a picture of one of the first pictures of me and you. It's one of the first pictures of you and Dave. And now we can bring on the one of the first pictures of you and Vic Shalfan. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, which oh, would look at that. But, so I, I looks, just you know what though? He looks exactly the he kind of looks the same. Yeah. He does. He well, maybe not there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, go back to the other one i think actually vic's wearing one of his homemade uh roxy uh t-shirts that he he sort of yeah it's like a bootleg that's, that's like a bootleg, a bootleg. I, and i actually want that design right now it's how i is, always want that more than vic gave me the hook shirt how is the revenue on that shirt uh vic so, um, you know what the <laughs> same amount i <laughs> got the hook from vic uh the vibe, the vibe, the vibe is I've made as much money off that bootleg T-shirt as I've made off the Tal Bachman "She's So High" video. How about wow, that? <laughs> you've got an amazing, you've got an amazing engagement with with everyone. I think everyone can see this with your interaction. Even you know, you've just carried the same. I feel like ethos along ever since those first emails back and forth to now having people come on your podcast and just touch and touch and base with people but what i really want to learn is there you are yeah, there it is yeah. rock the world oh. trying um, we are but can you who did you learn this from because i watch you do it and i think wow that's you know i i want to also this try and do might this. be one of the things yeah as yeah. a good question because i i honestly feel and this is no bullshit. We owe the fans everything. We owe anybody that supports us anything. Because mm -hmm. I and sometimes I think saying the word fans kind of is I know it is not kind right, of it, it's not the right word for it because word, yeah. they're supporting, they're they're helping our career. And right now that our career is or our sort of livelihood is in is sort of been thrown in disarray, 
you've been supporting. Everybody that's watching this right now has been supporting it. And I think it's, you know, it doesn't matter if it's right now that people are just now turning on to our world and learning the guitar lessons and all that kind of stuff. It's the years before when we, there wasn't, this crisis and we were still we've always been in crisis let's be honest we're, we're musicians we're always in financial yeah. crisis but i've always felt that the reason i'm going to have any sort of retirement is if the people that have been supporting me for all these years continue to support and i think alice feels the same way i as far as like I know that alice doesn't go out and shake everybody's hands after the show because you know he's He's an icon and he's an iconic dude. He's a household name, but honestly, he makes you feel like the most important person in the room when you're hanging out with him one-on-one -on -one. and anyone that's done VIP with him knows that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's where I sort of took the nod from mm. because I always felt, I always felt that he gave his fans as much as he could. Obviously there's certain places he can't go. There's mm -hmm. certain things. There's certain boundaries he can't cross, but guess what? I could because, you know, I was popular for 15 minutes after the show. What is that? It's the old GMP show. Wow. Look at that, man. That I want that shirt back. It's not that much <laughs> different than I look right now. No, look, don't worry that, about the guitar. I want the shirt back. Yeah. Well, the yeah. guitar, I know where that one's at, but that's a GMP Les Paul um, double cutaway. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love that one. That's a Mylar top. And that was on the brutally live. Um, but I love the the orange sort of pumas because I was so that was so Manchester rock yes. camouflage jeans, which I still have. Actually, they're just mm -hmm. now shorts. But that shirt itself on that shirt, if you zoom up, it says ping pong heroes. And I always love the term ping pong heroes. And well, that was basically. Yeah, might be. Yeah. But getting back to people that have supported us over the years. Like I said, I took my lead from Alice, but then I was able to do more things because I might have been popular for 15 minutes after the show, but then I could go back to being a normal Joe. I could go back to being this normal guy. And my thing was, while I can, maybe someday, who knows? Maybe someday it's 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 beyond. We have enough of a fan base and enough of a, a following that that we do have to sort of, you know, sort of stay in our little bubble. But while I can't, I will always reach out outside mm -hmm. the bubble because when we're on tour, it is a bubble. It, we're a family, our, our, our band, our crew, we, we travel inside a bubble, but I always want to vent, peek my head out to, uh, I guess, keep myself, remind myself that, you know, it's the real world out there. And it's, it's, this is, even though it's temporary, I've been able to make it, you know, 40 years temporary, which yeah. is, I, which is a very nice length of time. And if it was to end tomorrow, like who the fuck knows at this point in time, um, then I'm happy with it. But I knew that I was in touch with the people that supported me and hopefully they were in touch with me and they know who I am. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, like I said, the reason why I think people watch this show is because it's a no bullshit. I mean, of course we can be fabulous at times. Of course we can act, ask some silly questions and act a little bit ridiculous. But at the end of the day, we care about the people that support this. They care about us. And it's really important these days that uh, people feel like they belong to something, whether it's the Roxy Guitar Army or just people that come here every Tuesday to listen to us do our show and bring on guests because we are going through these times that uh, it's a little bit uh, surreal and yeah. kind of need to feel like we belong. And you guys, just so you know, all of you watching right now, you belong right now. And, and you know, give it up for Robbie. He's done a great job <laughs> sort of taking the reins of this one. You really have. Well, I, I heard a quote the other day that has resonated with me so much. And I keep, I'm keep saying it to myself, especially lately in the past even a few days. Is it take a Pe smile? People that do that, I've been saying, trying to do that one for two years. Um, <laughs> people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. Wow. You know, 
That sounds. I think if people can see that you're really passionate about something and they see how much you care about something, they care and they can see. That wasn't on a fortune cookie. Burn. You're sure that that wasn't on a fortune cookie of, of food that you Not a recent ordered one. in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I mean? I think people like that passion. Yeah. They like. It wasn't a like, song that Ferg tried to stump you on on your music trivia he show. <laughs> stumps me on all of those, especially when we have to. So 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 know. say it one more time. People don't buy what you do; they buy why you do it. Wow! All right, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I'll have to put that in my wheelhouse. I don't know. How I'm gonna put it. Put it in your fortune cookies tonight. Can, <laughs> I definitely will. Um, I want to push on, just drive on a little bit more because um, you've been on for an hour. I think it's that the I, people are tired. Wait, wait, can I just tired? Can, no, 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 no. We gotta, we gotta. I want to try and wrap this up in a certain way, even though we've okay. lost over so much. Let's have part but, two. Let's have part two. Well, I mean, maybe we should, yeah. But but, um, wrap, but wrap it up the way you see fit. Not you know, like I said, we when we started this and we had the idea earlier this mm -hmm. week because it was my f up that I didn't realize that we had Michael Monroe this week, but it's going to be next week. So Michael Monroe next week. Thank you. Start promoting it right now, Federock. But I said that I would be the John Stewart, and you will be my John Oliver. Because yes. I remember watching John Stewart's show when John Oliver took over. So, John Oliver, please wrap it up the way you see fit, not me. Well, and and my and, and a little claim to fame, although I'm not claiming to really any fame, is that John Oliver is from my hometown in Bedford, and I went to the same high school as John Oliver. I went to Mark Rutherford Upper School, um, and yeah, that's where John Oliver went to school as well, um, <laughs> a few years before me. So, I guess. Um, on the 25th of May, 2018, Imagine Your Reality came out. Yes, it did. Um, that feels to me like that, that album kind of came out of nowhere. How long had you been working on that? And how old? Actually, I think I'm, I, I may have asked you this question before, but you've got some. There was a song that I guess like from maybe early 2000s I made it onto that one, Live and Die in LA, and or certainly the riff and stuff the, like that. That was from the Slash era. That was from yeah. the Slash to Snake Pit area. If you actually listen to the, uh, um, if you listen, because we didn't talk anything about the Slash Snake Pit era, but no, if you I listen know. to that guitar playing on that, you could tell there's a direct correlation from uh, the riff and sort of the, the guitar style. Mm -hmm. uh, but the album is a collection of, older song ideas that have been percolating for years, even before Roxy 77 uh, albums as well. There's some riffs there, mm -hmm. but also a bunch of current ideas. Mm -hmm. And the main goal for Imagine Your Reality was to make a guitar-driven album with my name being associated as the guitarist from Alice Cooper. I wanted, I didn't want to people to think that, okay, here comes a, a pop artist or a pop uh, yeah heavy pop i wanted there to be guitar solos in every out in every song so 10 songs 10 guitar solos and that's what we've managed to do uh the production team did a really great job with all the songs you know whether it was christopher fullen with with songs like over and done or the cover that we did with uh, california man or it was tommy hendrickson with um you know with uh, me generation or never mind me so these I listened to the production team and uh, made the best album guitar driven album that I could. And like any other album, it has a spectrum. Any other album that I was influenced by mm -hmm. has a spectrum of music. It's not just 10 of the same songs. So within that one album, you'll see a bunch of different uh colors and and styles you'll it'll it'll range from punk rock nirvana to more sort of april march uh pop rock like with hearts and trouble so mm -hmm. you just gotta, if you enjoy guitar you'll enjoy the album so and, and for those of you that are watching if you haven't checked out the album yeah go check it out i, I i'm i'm happy about it uh scotty one of the members of our sort of roxy guitar army team he runs uh Belly Ache Records, which mm -hmm. taught me originally called Balachi Records. And uh, yeah, I, I'm happy with the record. And the the video that Vic just did on last Sunday's uh, Sunday Livestream Sunday, 
uh, Heart for Hearts in Trouble. That's officially coming out later this week. I didn't want wow. to step on your release of your single, <laughs> Take a Smile, no, but mine's coming out at the end of the week. So Very you have sweet. three more days, motherfucker. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. It's grind time. I want to just ask one more question. Sure. Um, is anyone ever really out of the trenches? Um, I hope not. I hope that everyone stays in the trenches with us. And because being in the trenches is sort of enjoying the journey. Mm. I, I think the only time you get out of the trenches is when you're actually maybe buried. Mm, <laughs> in buried. The trenches. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a trench, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but keep on working with whatever goal it is. You know, it's my, it's my belief that everybody's good at something. Mm-hmm. And, and and there's so there's some every person is an expert at something. So whatever it is that causes you know you to say this doesn't feel like a job, mm-hmm. then do that. Yeah. All right, unless it's killing people. Yeah, obviously. I mean, and there's some probably professional murderers out there. Yeah, congratulations, <laughs> really good at it. But. <laughs> No, I'm saying it's, as long as positive, as long as it's a positive process yeah. and it, it makes you feel like it's not work, then go for it and that window will open. Okay. You know? And yeah. it's, it's, it's open for me. It's opening for you. Um, you know, like yeah. I said, everyone that's out there, go for it. And thank you again for always supporting us over here at uh, yeah. Roxy TV. Well, I just want to um, I want to finish up this first part of this whole okay. event. So if you can just stick around, Ryan, um, we're going to just we're going to just finish up the, the podcast. So Ryan Roxy, thank you so much for coming on In the Trenches today. It's been great having you. I think we have to do a part two sure. of this. Um, but thank you so much. We're going to wrap up the podcast here if you're listening on your Spotify and whatnot. Um, so thank you for being on In the Trenches. It's been a pleasure. Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Now, what the hell happened with that? Why is that that layover so loud, Vic? But do you know what? It's 